Good day. This is Inside Law. I'm your host, Gerald Goldfarb. As our regular viewers know, Inside Law is a uh, discussion and interview program in which we try to give you members of the public an inside picture of how the legal system really works. Nowadays, uh, the public uh, receives a lot of fantasized pictures about the legal system, such as in television programs like uh, L.A. Law and the old days of Perry Mason Show. And uh, this program tries to give a more uh, realistic view of how uh, the legal system works. I'm very pleased to have as a guest today a, a very prominent uh, Los Angeles lawyer and an expert in the field of divorce, Michael Kogan. Good day, Michael. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Michael Kogan is a graduate of UCLA Law School and also has a business administration degree from UCLA. He's a partner in the Santa Monica law firm of Kelly and Kogan, which specializes in divorce law. He's an instructor at the Advanced Professional Program at USC, which means he teaches divorce uh, law to uh, other lawyers. He's been a uh, judge pro tem in the, uh, in the Superior Court dealing with family law matters, and he's a uh, co-founder and director of the Positive uh, Divorce Institute, which is something, positive divorce is something we're all striving for if we're getting a divorce these days. Michael, maybe we can uh, begin our discussion by talking a little bit about the uh, mental state of parties who come to you uh, because they have a divorce or family law uh, problem. What sort of mental states do people have, whether they're male or female, when they come to you for legal advice? Well, it, that is actually a very interesting topic and, and, and one that I feel quite strongly about. Um, there is a study out of UCLA called the Holmes Rahe study, which was uh, named after the people who did the study. And they listed life's uh, most traumatic events. The second most traumatic event in a person's life is, the, uh, is, the, is a divorce. Now, I had thought when I heard this first, and my partner we would give presentations on it, I thought this was really exaggerated. And uh, I'm married, and I have a, a son named uh, Benjamin. My wife's name's Louise. And so one day I turned to my partner and I said, you know, this study is really baloney. Who can say that, that a divorce is more traumatic than the death of a child? And he, said, he turned to me and he said, what would be harder for you, Michael? And when I thought about it, I knew honestly that while I would never wish anything to happen to my child, that it would be harder for me for my wife to leave me. Mm -hmm. If my, that would be, there'd be nobody to lean on. You know, there is in, in a relationship, certainly in my relationship, you look for your emotional strength to handle the difficult situations with your wife. And it is, it is an incredibly traumatic event. And the, and the unfortunate thing, in terms of our general sensitivities, is that it is so common divorce mm -hmm. that we become desensitized to it, like we were desensitized uh, during the Vietnamese War to, uh, to the injuries we would see. We'd see it every night, so another another leg blown off, another amount of, another person dying, it's body counts, it's no big deal. And, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, but don't you as a lawyer, aren't you getting jaded now when uh, people come into your office, oh, it's just another divorce, you tell your partner, don't you? Uh, oh, another case, another divorce. Honestly, no. I, I think the, the as, as we become more established and more successful, more confident that we know what we're doing, uh, there's more of an opportunity really just to, uh, to uh, just to be with uh, with the clients and, and uh, their emotional trauma. The problem is, is that a lot of people going through the divorce have a trouble experiencing their emotions that they're suppressing and you know, they're pretending and it's all right or uh, that's you difficult. You have to be more than just a lawyer when these people come into your office then. You really have to be a counselor, don't you? Well, we try to really actually avoid that, but we would like to be the kind of human being that can uh, appreciate that there's a human being in front of us, uh, not, just a, not just a case. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to just add one thing that I think is very important. If you listen to psychologists who know this area, most people uh, who are in the midst of a divorce are really going through a temporary mental illness. Mm -hmm. And uh, That's my experience, too. I see divorce clients sometimes. Well, it's, there's, no, there's no question about well, do it. Do you send them to a psychiatrist or to a psychotherapist when you perceive that happening? 
Sometimes. There's interaction here between the psychotherapist and the lawyers. Is there any? Well, uh, there is in some cases. Uh, I have found my experience has been is that most of the times, times when I've recommended it, the clients are very reluctant. They don't see. Mm -hmm. It's like any type of thing. Um, <coughs> they don't really expect to get this from an attorney. They don't expect the attorney to say, I think there's something wrong, or, you know, it's like, what do you think there's something wrong with me? Um, so we don't refer that many people because they don't, it's not really expected of us from our clientele. People don't seem to be able to hear it. But we do interact a lot with psychotherapists and, and, and counselors who are working with people. And, of course, it becomes very critical uh, during uh, during child custody cases. And actually the courts require a certain amount of psychological counseling uh, uh, when there's child custody involved, don't they? They don't, re they don't require it, but if you're going to win a child custody case, if you don't have expert testimony, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's required. Uh, but you really need professional testimony because the judge, how's he going to make up his mind? Mm -hmm. You say, you know, everyone's throwing dirt at each other, but the standard is what's the best interest of the child, so you, you need this professional testimony that's convincing to the judge. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, along these lines, I know there's been a lot of talk in the legal profession about the use of mediation, particularly in the divorce field, so as to sort of minimize the kind of heated litigation uh, and try to bring things to a settlement in a more efficient way. Do you find that you use a lot of mediation in your practice, and how does it work? I was at one point doing uh, some mediation. Importantly, I would have both people sign a contract, which would say that if they did settle it, they always had to have the contract, the settlement agreement, reviewed by independent attorneys. Uh, it was my experience that usually uh, either the man or the woman, it wasn't uh, sexually based, it just depended in the relationship was using the mediation for a manipulation. I know that's not everybody's experience, but it was mine. Uh -huh. uh, that, so that the continuity of what was going on in the marriage or some variation of the marriage yeah, game? Well, well, you know, one of my, uh, I don't know about favorite uh, sayings, but one of the things that strike me as accurate, although perhaps a little cruel in, 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 in its, its bareness, is that people expect, people who've had a lousy marriage expect to have a good divorce. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the divorce follows the marriage. And if you have one person who's dominating versus people who just kind of grow apart, mm -hmm. you have all the bitterness and you have all the manipulation. And um, I don't favor mediation, especially when there are significant assets involved. Because this is a, a, a very, this is perhaps the, the most significant financial event that's going to happen to these people and especially mm -hmm. oftentimes to the women if you're talking about support and division of the family home and the assets and if it's not done properly I don't even mean maliciously but there if it's not understood uh, that um, there can be tremendous negative consequences mm -hmm. and I think there's a trend now developing that the attorneys are going to be much more involved in trying to almost being financial planners mm -hmm. in trying to maximize through tax planning and and the way different burdens are born mm -hmm. uh... to maximize the 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 uh, the ability for a lifestyle from both of these people isn't there a sort of a built-in bias against mediation on the part of lawyers after all if there's going to be litigation the lawyer is going to make a substantial fee and if there's going to be mediation the lawyers fee might be much less don't you think that colors maybe not yours particularly michael but in the general uh... the status of mediation in the field isn't it colored by that i know that that uh, that's what, what i'm going to think. Yeah, i know that's what people think and i and i know that this is what i'm going to say I don't think anyone's going to believe, but it's nonetheless my you, observation. Mike, <laughs> um, it is really not the money aspect for most attorneys that affects the mediation or the, the willingness to settle. Uh, what, let's say a, um, a woman comes to me and says, I want to mediate my divorce. I don't want any problems. My husband's told me everything, and we have it all settled. If I don't do what's called discovery. If I don't get from the husband under oath what the list of assets are mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am guilty of malpractice. Mm -hmm. Now it is part of 
as attorneys, we are as trapped in the system as people think we run the system, but we're trapped in the standards that the system has. For example, let's say that the husband runs a small business. Now the wife, if it was developed during the marriage, is entitled to half of the business. Now, what is the value of the business? I'm not an appraiser. I don't know what the value is. There is a, 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 an aspect of the business called goodwill. Mm -hmm. It's not a tangible thing that you can touch. What goodwill is, is basically the value that's been added to the business by the fact that it's been in business, mm -hmm. that has good customer relations, and it's a real economic value, but it's not tangible. You can't take it to an appraiser and say, how much is this widget worth, or how much is this whatever. Mm -hmm. It is an intangible. So if a, let's say this woman comes to me and says to me, uh, my husband and I have decided he's going to keep the business, the business is worth $50,000. And I'll say, well, how did you achieve, you know, come to that, and they'll tell me. But if I don't have an appraiser, mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And five years later, she learns that, you know, that it was worth a heck of a lot more than she thought. Mm -hmm. Then she comes back and turns to me and says, I paid you money. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you do this? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, you wanted it. If I were to say, I'd say, well, you wanted it mediated, mm -hmm. and you told me not to do it. Mm -hmm. She said, but, but I was very upset. You know I was very upset. Mm -hmm. I was relying on you. It, see, we are caught in the same quicksand. If I don't get an appraisal, mm -hmm. then later on what will happen is I will be able to be accused of not doing my job properly. It's just like the medical profession. If you don't do all the x-rays, then someone uh, may sue you later down the line. The same thing with the legal profession. Ex ex exactly. Plus the fact we are dealing with people, as I've told you, mm -hmm. who are in bad, are in mm -hmm. difficult mental condition. So if we say we listen to them, they'll say, why did you listen to me? Why did I hire you? You've got to practice defensive law, just like the doctors practice defensive medicine. It's defensive, but a lot of these rules make sense. I mean, you would have, uh, you find very common among, not all women, but there's a certain group of women, for example, who want to avoid conflict at any cost. Mm -hmm. But this is during the divorce process. Once they get mm -hmm. through it and develop more, get regrounded, if you will, mm -hmm. then they feel differently. It's our job to protect people from this emotionalism that's affecting an economic decision. One of the parties, at least in a divorce, is likely to be in a weakened condition and really needs the support, not so much the hostility, but the support uh, of the lawyer to protect uh, their interests. I'd like to ask True. you about some of the trends that are presently going on in the divorce system. Uh, you, there's always a lot of friction that you see in the newspapers and in the media, too. There are always men who are saying the system is biased against them. There are women who are saying the system is biased against them. We've had various studies over the years, and there are various trends happening. And uh, I wonder, you're on top of the situation. I think, Michael, what is going on in the, uh, in the system these days? Well, there, there are a couple of things... Uh, uh, that are going on. In terms of child custody, uh, originally when I first began practicing law there was a tremendous bias towards the mother gets the child and the, and the father gets reasonable visitation every other weekend. Uh, there were studies that showed that perhaps the best way to have custody was joint custody which really means joint legal and physical custody which would mean that, that each parent would have the child about the same amount of time. And the law was passed that says that's the preference. Mm -hmm. That is the judicial preference under the laws of the state of California. Mm -hmm. However, as a practical matter, mm -hmm. what we found is that this rarely occurs where both parents have the child an equal so, amount I mean, of time. The preference under the law is that a child equal would seem to me maybe the child would live for two weeks with the mother and then two weeks with the father. Is that sort of what that's the law right. contemplated? That's exactly right. yeah. So if, if that's practical, then you sort of have a right to that. You, you have a, a preference you have for a preference. it. Like if I'm the father, for example, and I'm living in the same neighborhood and I can provide a bedroom, then uh, the law is, would be inclined to allow the child to live with me half the time. Is that right? That's right. That's, that's, then as why a, isn't that happening more often? Because as, as a practical um, economic sociological situation, what you find is that both parents aren't close enough. One parent lives in Huntington Beach, the other lives in ha Pasadena. I mean, it, it doesn't work out too much logistically. Mm -hmm. But what you seem to be, what it seems to be the stasis that we've reached, the balance, is that um, uh, there is the, the conventional wisdom now is that the, the weekend daddy, the Disneyland daddy is not a good thing, and there is a, a, a strong 
bias in a very affirmative uh, sense of the uh, of use of that word towards maximizing contact. Now, that's on the child custody uh, end of it. So we don't get joint custody, but we get a lot of contact. Mm -hmm. And uh, fathers are not cut out. Mm -hmm. And I would say that fathers have as much of, a, of an opportunity, truly, in the courts mm -hmm. to have custody, mm -hmm. except generally mm -hmm. you're not going to get either parent cutting out the other. Okay. So the trend on the custody side is sort of uh, to give more equality or more uh, uh, contact to the father. But on the economic side, maybe the trend is the other way, to maybe more toward the female. I was interested particularly in, in our conversation earlier about the difference between equity and equality. Right. Well, under the laws as they exist now, uh, the court is required to divide the assets equally. You take, if you want, for an example, in terms of assets, you have a house with a net value after the deed of trust of 100000 and a business with a value of, after all of its debts, of 100000 What happens very often is that the, the woman gets the house and the man gets the business. I use man and woman here in terms of the way it most usually occurs, although as women become more and more professionals and uh, upgrade economically, the situations are reversed. So that's an equal division. Now, what has been the trend that is developing, it hasn't happened yet in the law, but there is um, a Justice King who is one of the leading court of uh, appellate judges in, uh, in, in the family law area because he's very knowledgeable in it. Uh, has been discussing that there would be an equitable distribution, not necessarily an equal distribution. Because equitable means more like fair rather than exactly a divided. That's right. Because uh, uh, an equally divided, uh, an equally an equal division is not necessarily fair. I'll give you an example in terms of the house. The woman gets the house. Now she cannot afford to move out. It has a hundred thousand dollars in value, but it has no real meaning to her because she can't borrow against it, she doesn't have an income, she can't go into, she has no ability to repay any loan, so she can't borrow against the equity. She basically has the right to live in the house at a relatively modest level. On the other hand, in the example I gave you, the man has the business and has the ability to generate income so that he can live at a standard, even though he doesn't have the house anymore, that's a lot higher than, than the woman's. Mm -hmm. And this has been kind of a concern because there have been some studies that have indicated that the standard of living of the wives go down sort of and an the husbands go up. There's sort of an impoverishment of women that happens a little too often in the divorce uh, situation. Yeah, I don't really feel it's as sexually based mm -hmm. as the studies indicated. It's much more of a reflection of a general societal problem mm -hmm. or a, a societal inequity whereby uh, most of the, the well-paying jobs and the economic strength uh, resides with males. Mm -hmm. So the person in the weaker economic position ends up worse off in the divorce. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, um, how about overall, Michael? Do you think that this, you've been in the system now for a good many years. Do you think the system works fairly overall? Uh, do you think that good results happen or is the system working poorly? That's a very difficult question. I, I would want to say I know a all your things. clients do well. I understand <laughs> that, but uh, overall. Well, I think I would like to say that, that uh, in Los Angeles mm -hmm. that there are the vast number of judicial officers are bright, they're interested, uh, and that there's a good opportunity for a fair result. I view results as that there is a, a set of fair results. There's not the fair result. It's sort of like, you know, numbers two, four, six, eight, they're all the set of even numbers. There's a set of fair results, mm -hmm. and you want to get in that range, and I think that's achieved quite a bit. The unfortunate thing, the thing I don't know how to resolve, mm -hmm. uh, where it doesn't work well is if people do not have the economic wherewithal to hire, hire an attorney who's knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference in results, and you can, um, you know, the, the child custody issue is a very obviously closest to every parent's heart, mm -hmm. and yet you can have no money and have a serious child custody problem, you won't have the same resources. I think the truth is, is that the same economic bias that's throughout our whole economic mm -hmm. system demonstrates itself also in the uh, legal system, in the divorce field as well, and uh, like everything else, if you have money, 
you do better. That's the truth. And if you're a, if you're a poor person, you don't have a lot of money to devote to your lawyer, then you may get a short shrift uh, from the system. It, it, it's short shrift because the, the poorer person's not trained to present mm -hmm. their case. It's hard to discern the true facts. And um, the poorer person may get a short shrift, but not intentionally. It's not, it is the system is so overwhelmed. The assets that we are devoting to our legal system is so much less than is necessary, really. And you know that the... It's not only the women who are impoverished in divorces, the judges and the court system is well, an impoverished system, isn't it? It's that's a, what I've noticed. It's a big issue for me, yeah. personally. You know that it used to be that judges were fairly well paid. Not, you couldn't become rich becoming a judge, but you were getting well compensated. And these are people who are making decisions about hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars have tremendous impact on people's lives. But for example, even though a judge pays, uh, maybe it pays $80,000, mm -hmm. and that's not a, a small amount of money, and I'm not saying it is. But, you know, I'm raising two children, I gotta send them to school, et cetera. It would be hard for me where I offered a position to take it and not have a big income, mm -hmm. a big income deficit or a big change, a big impact on my family and some of the, the things I wanted to accomplish financially or to have really security. Mm -hmm. There's a judge who lives around the corner from me and his house is the most run down in the neighborhood mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, your judges are going to be people generally uh, from an upper middle class area and that's, they're going to be people who've been educated and successful. I'll give you an example. One of the, uh, Sam Williams, who is uh, a very fine lawyer in Los Angeles, was offered a uh, position on the Supreme Court. Yes. He turned it down. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of top people turning it down mm -hmm. and it's not only because the money's not mm -hmm. adequate mm -hmm. to keep up a, a, a standard of living people have been used to, but it's also that the courts, the support systems, the courts are dirty. They don't get the kind of equipment. We have in Santa Monica, the judges, the courtrooms are trailers. That's, that's and, just very distasteful to yeah. me. And, and what it does is, 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 that, is that if you are a person, for example, in my office, we've invested a lot of money in a computer system. Mm -hmm. And the courtrooms are way behind us in this. Mm -hmm. So we are much better equipped than them. And it is something that uh, diminishes or, or it means that a judge has to, uh, has to be dealing with these uh, less assets and less uh, uh, to produce the results and, yeah. and deal with his cases. I, I think it just uh, it leaves the legal system in a somewhat disrespectful uh, position and the judges don't get the respect and the that they deserve when that, uh, when that happens. And, well, you will also see the development now of a private judicial system. It is very common now mm -hmm. what they have called renter judges. People leave the bench, mm -hmm. they get 200 to 200, 150 to 250 an hour mm -hmm. to judge a case privately. Mm -hmm. And from, for people who have money, mm -hmm. and they're paying attorneys somewhere between 150 to 250 or $300 an hour, mm -hmm. it's more economic. Mm -hmm to hire a private judge and you see yeah. a lot of your top judicial officers leaving the bench and making a lot more money with a lot less effort outside of it. Michael, and, the, uh, this is a good point and we had Judge Choate on this show a few oh, months ago and we talked about it. I need to shift gears right now. I want to thank you for this conversation. Thank you. I want to do uh, a bit of legal commentary as is my habit on this program for the last few minutes about a matter that was of some interest to me and maybe to the public as well. Just about a week ago, if you remember, the Queen Elizabeth II docked in uh, San Pedro and the customs agents decided to use it as a test case. Instead of letting the people go through customs in an hour, as is usually the case, they did an elaborate search. These people had, were mainly older people coming back from a long cruise and they had had a, about an eight-hour stopover in the nation of Colombia and the people thought that was suspicious. The customs people did, so all the luggage, every single piece of luggage was searched. Dogs, or there were about 10 dogs that were used to sniff uh, luggage on the uh, steamship. The people uh, were delayed as much as six hours before they could get off of the uh, steamship. And uh, it made the front page of all the newspapers. The, uh, what were the results uh, of this uh, particular aggressive activity by the customs agent? First of all, of course, it was bad for the steamship line. People are not going to be inclined to take steamships if when they come home after a restful vacation they have uh, six hours of grief. 
Uh, certainly the country of Colombia is not going to be favored by uh, steamships after this. A lot of people were frustrated and angry. A lot of people missed their connections, airplane connections. People missed the people who were going to pick them up. Uh, and it was a generally a very big imposition on people who no one had the slightest idea necessarily that they were carrying any illegal drugs. And the, uh, the government, uh, the, the total result of searching well over a thousand passengers and their luggage was that they found one gram of marijuana. Ludicrous result for all the effort that was put into it. It was, was obviously a publicity stunt by the government in which people were imposed upon, in my view, for no good reason. And it seems to me that this is a legal system that isn't working properly when this sort of result, uh, and when this sort of result occurs. I want to thank all of you for watching today. Please feel free to write to us if you have any comments of, or questions. Write to us care of this station. This has been Inside Law, and I'm your host, Gerald Goldfarb. Good day. For further information, please call Inside Law at area code 213-285-8599.